it's time to start. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon or good noon. Okay. Uh, welcome to attend uh, the lecture by Professor Harvard Schoenberg. Okay, first of all, it's our pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Okay, uh, Harvard Schoenberg is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Munich in Germany. He's a member of Bavarian uh, ba Academy of Science in Germany. Academical background. Harvard Swindberg studied mathematics from 1961 at the Free University of Berlin and from 1964 at the University of Master, where he received his doctorate in 1968 from Dieter Rodin. From 1974 to 1978, he is a professor of mathematics in University of Heidelberg. Since 1978, he has been professor of mathematical logic at the University of Munich. His research fields uh, include proof theory, computability theory, constructive mathematics, lambda calculus, applications of logic in computer science. Uh, here is some of his books and the papers in Hannah Books. He is one of the editors of the forthcoming Handbook of Constructive Mathematics, which will be published in Cambridge University Press next year. He is one author of the book Proofs and Computations with Stanley Winner in the series of Perspective in Logic, published by Association for Symbolic Logic and the Cambridge University Press. 2012. He is one author of the book Basic Proof Theory with Alan Strostro, uh, published in Cambridge Press 2000, pressed in Theoretical Computer Science 43. He is left for many papers in top juniors. He is also the author of papers in handbook such as Handbooks of Computability Theory and the Handbook of Mathematical Logic. This time, Professor Hammer Swindberg will give two lectures at Wuhan University about normal forms of proof in natural deduction. Uh, the lecture one is about the existence and the uniqueness of normal forms of proof in natural deduction, just tonight. And in the second lecture, he will talk about the complexity of normal forms of proof in natural deduction. The second lecture will be held on next Wednesday, the same time. Okay. So you're also welcome to attend the second lecture, the second, the second lecture of uh, the first one. Okay, it's also our pleasure to introduce our interlocutor, Dr. San Sandos. Uh, Dr. San Sandos got his PhD from the Department of Mathematics at the University of Ghent in Bergen. After that, he got his postdoctoral position at the University of Munich in Germany, University of Leeds in UK, and the Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. Currently, he is a researcher in rural, in rural University Bochum in Germany. His research fields include high-order reverse mathematics, truth zero, and the computability zero. Okay. Uh, that's all for our uh, short introduction. And uh, uh, after the main lecture, uh, San Sanders will give a, a brief, uh, uh, some comment or questions uh, for around uh, 50 minutes. And uh, during the lecture, uh, if audience have any question, you're welcome to post your question in the chat box. And uh, the officers uh, from Xu Xu will forward your question to us. After the main lecture, uh, the speaker will uh, answer your questions. Okay, that's all for the introduction. Now, this will come Professor Harvard Schoenberg's first lecture on the normal form of proof in natural deduction. Uh, the first lecture is about existence and uh, uniqueness. Okay, please, Professor. <coughs> oh, I close my, yeah, I close yes. my yes. Um, screen, and you, now you can share your screen. Uh, sorry.
doesn't work on my side. So you, I still see your screen. Okay, okay, okay. Now it seems to be fine. Let's see. Okay, uh, can, see, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah, very good. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Chen for his initiative to make that event happen and all the energy he put into this uh, project. So this will be a lecture on proof theory. And uh, so why should we be interested in proofs? Uh, well, the characteristic feature of mathematics is that it is the only science which can prove its statements. And so it is very natural that the science would reflect on its main methods. And that makes it sort of mandatory that you research about proofs or in other words, just do proof theory. So that's the reason why I'm interested in it. And I hope I can demonstrate some of the beauties of proof theory in this lecture. So let me start with some kind of uh, reminder. You might know many of the things I will say in this first section. And the reminder will, is that I will consider proofs in minimal logic. And why is it that I do it? Well, we have this inclusion, which you see down here in the display. Uh, minimal logic is just uh, not as the name says a minimal, but in a sense a maximal logic, because classical logic is included in intuitionistic logic, and that in turn is included in minimal logic. And I will use some time at the beginning to give you some reasons of why this is the case. Second point I want to stress is for generating proofs, I use a proof system called natural deduction, which was long ago introduced by Konogorov and also Genson. And why is that important? Well, natural deduction is, first of all, as the name says, a very natural way to do proofs, kind of tries to mimic the style you do proofs anyway. And on the other hand, it makes it very obvious that natural deduction and the so-called lambda calculus are structurally almost the same. I will bring that out in the second part of this lecture on the so-called curry howard correspondence. Now, let's just have a short reminder of what natural deduction is. It's just a system of rules that you use for proofs. So the first rule is the so-called assumption rule. You see that I can mark it. Almost. Anyway, just forget it. Uh, so we have, an, you are able to write down an assumption of a certain formula and give it a label called U here. And that's something which is already a proof, but it depends, of course, on this U. Now, for the logical connectors, at the moment we just look at the arrow and the universal quantifier and the logical rules relating to them come in pairs. We have an introduction rule, which you see here on the left. Yeah, now it works at least somehow. So if you have a proof M of a formula B, which may assume an assumption A in labeled U, then you can just do a so-called arrow introduction. And from that proof, you infer the formula A implies B. And at this point, you get independent of the assumption of A labeled U up there. So you mark that by just writing uh, index U next to this introduction rule. And similar, there is the rule of error elimination or modus ponens, as it's called sometimes, which says if you have a derivation M of M A implies B and another one N of A, then you can infer B, that's sort of obvious. And quite similar are the introduction and elimination rules for the universal quantifier, which you see at the bottom. So the introduction rule to the left says if you have a derivation M of a formula A, and if a so-called variable condition holds, that means this derivation M 
does not assume anything on the variable x. That means all the free assumptions that you may have in such a derivation do not concern formulas which contain the variable x free, so which say something about the variable x. If it's not the case, that means x is arbitrary in this sense, you can infer for all x a. That's introduction rule and then the elimination rule on the right just does the obvious thing. If you have a derivation of all x a, and I write a bracket x to make uh, substitution easier to denote, so a of x just means nothing, but when I later write a of t, which is in the bottom line, then this just means substitute in the formula a for the variable x, the term t. So that's elimination rule. So these are rather simple, and let's have a look at the other logical connectives that you would like to have. On top, you have the disjunction, A or B. So how is that handled? Well, again, we have introduction rules and elimination rules. Introduction rules are to the left. So if you have A, then you can infer A or B, and similarly for B. A little more delicate is this rule for the elimination. If you have a derivation m of a or b, and you want to carry on and prove a goal called c, then what you intuitively would do is to do a case distinction. So you have a two, you need two subderivations. The first one assumes the left-hand case a, and then argues for a while and gets to the conclusion c. That's the, the derivation m, and you need a second one which gives you the same c, but now assuming the right-hand side of the disjunction. That means uh, you take the formula B and give it a label V. And then arrow lim just allows you to conclude C independently of the two assumptions U and V. And so we mark them on the side of the denotation of the rule. That's the arrow, the or minus rule. Then uh, for the conjunction, that's uh, sort of easy, so the introduction rule to the left is quite clear. If you have derived A and B, you may conclude A and B. And the elimination rule on the right looks a little peculiar, but it's formulated in this form because that fits easier into the so-called curry howard correspondence with natural reduction. So suppose on the left you have a derivation of M for the formula A and B, and then you work on the goal C and assume in addition you have a derivation N, which is allowed to assume both A and B with labels U and B. And then if you have this derivation, you are allowed to conclude C irrespective of the two assumptions U and B, because you know them by M. And finally, we have to deal with the existential quantifier. So what's that? Here to the left, you just assume you have a derivation of A of T. And in addition, you are given the term T. And if you have these two data, you have an instance of the formula A, namely the instance where X is substituted by T. And exactly that is uh, stated by the introduction rule you are allowed to infer there is an X A of X. And finally, the existence elimination is the following. If you have a derivation of there is an X A right here, uh, difficult to uh, I give up, of uh, there is an X A by M and another one deriving a desired conclusion B from assuming A, then you can cancel both the you can cancel the assumption labeled U of A, and also note that the variable X is the one which is bound here in the formula that is an X A and can infer B. So that's the technically correct formulation of these rules. You may already see that it's close to lambda calculus, but we will bring that out a little later. So what is the next thing? you are probably missing negation. 
So this is minimal logic and in minimal logic negation plays no role. So we just define it by assuming that we have a propositional variable which we denote by the water morphosity symbol in this first display. So that's the definition of not A. And then it's quite easy to see that from A you can derive not not A, which if you unfold the definition of not just says that from A and from the assumption A implies bottom, you get bottom of falsity. So this direction is provable. For the converse, uh, we have a problem. It's a general not derivable in our behavior logic. However, if we add one more negation outside, so we have a triple negation of A, then it's possible to derive from that a single location, uh, negation of A. Now, we can, this, uh, we have this junction on existential quantifier introduced already. We will now introduce uh, so-called weak or classical variants of the two connectives. I write them with a little twiddle, which you see here in the first display. And so what does A weak or B mean? Well, it just means not A implies not B implies bottom. Notice that the arrow associates to the right. So I could equivalently written, have written here not A and not B implies falsity, but it's easier for later considerations that we avoid conjunction wherever possible. So if you just view implication as associated to the right, you can read that as it is intended to be. And similar, the weak existential quantifier, which is written here in this line, this is defined uh, by not for all not A. This, where the X is, of course, bound by the universal quantifier. Now, these are called weak variants. Why are they weak? Well, we can easily derive from the rules you have seen that the strong disjunction, A or B, implies the weak disjunction and similarly for the existential quantifier. However, the converse does not hold. So this little observation will make it possible what I promised in the first slide, namely that we can embed classical logic into our minimal logic. So let me first be a little more precise about what we mean by derivability in intuitionistic or classical logic. I already said in minimal logic, falsity plays no role. So now we define two sets of formulas, EFQ for X files of Kotlibet and STAP for stability. And they just say what you see here. So EFQ says for all list of variables X, if we assume falsity, then we can infer that R holds for this arbitrary Google of objects X. And we do not need falsity here in this set. And similarly, the stability axiom means that we have the so-called stability property of the predicate Rx, namely not not Rx implies Rx. You can, might also understand that as a principle of indirect proof for the relation R, namely if from assuming R we can derive a contradiction, Sorry, from assuming that R is not true, so assuming not R, we can derive a contradiction, and that is about the same as that R holds. So that's a so-called principle of indirect proof. So now let's define intuitionistic logic. So uh, set gamma of formulas derives intuitionistically a formula A just means that this set gamma union EFQ derives in minimal logic A. And similarly for classical logic, where you just take stability instead of x -fuzzle. Now, I'd like to demonstrate that and how classical logic is embedded in minimal logic. And for that purpose, we need to generalize our stability principle, which we have for 
atomic formulas to arbitrary formulas. And that's done in the theory here. So if you assume for both A and B that they are stable, you can infer that also the conjunction A and B is stable. The second item B says the same for implication, but note that we only need to assume stability for the conclusion B. So you can derive that in minimal logic, and on the next slide I will show you such a derivation to make you a little bit familiar of how it is to do proofs in minimal logic. And finally, C does the same thing for the universal quantifier. It's written in this form without a universal quantifier here because proof then is a little bit easier. So in particular, when we have this theorem, we can conclude that the general principle of stability is derivable in classical logic. However, only for formulas which make sense for persons who would like to deal with classical logic, namely for people who do not want to consider the strong existential or the strong disjunction, but are happy with a weak form of them. And they are defined, so anything that's of interest for somebody arguing classically is covered here. So as long as A doesn't contain or, or it exists, then we can derive stability. So now let's go back to this B part here and have a look how the derivation will look like. To be a little shorter, I just leave out the introduction, the error introduction at the very end. I just derive B from the assumptions U, stability of B, V, double negation of A implies B, and W, A. These were the three assumptions we had in our formula B. Now, how do we proceed? Well, in natural deduction, we are allowed to freely assume something. So, on the upper right, we assume U2 for the formula A implies B and W for A, and then arrow LM, which I haven't written explicitly here, but it's clear that this is meant, derives B. Now we take a further assumption of not B, which is B implies falsity. We get falsity. Now for the first time, we cancel an assumption, and this time it's the assumption U2 up here and can infer not A implies B. So why do we do that? Well, we have another assumption, B, which says the double negation of A implies B. And here we have the single negation, if you apply the former to the latter, we get again falsity. And the so next step, we cancel our assumption U1, the one up here, and this was an assumption of not B. We have derived falsity from it, so altogether we get not not B. And now, finally, we can use our assumption in B, namely that B is stable, not not B implies B, and we get B. So this kind of interaction of arrow introduction and arrow eliminations is crucial for the kind of proofs that you have to do here. Now, to give you a little impression of what is different when we work in uh, classical logic embedded into minimal logic from what you normally know is uh, written up in the lemma here, which concerns the interaction of weak existence with implication. So here we have a weak existence to the left of an arrow, and on the right we have taken out this exists, it becomes an O. And of course, X should be a free and B. And that this thing is derivable, we get for free. So it's just doable in minimal logic once you unfold, unfold this weak existence here. If you want to go the other way around, so from right to left, that's the next line. You can't do it in minimal logic, but the only thing you need to do it is stability of B. Now, what happens if we have the weak existence on the right-hand side with x not free and a? Well, we would expect that we can pull out the existential quantifier to the front. Well, this is possible, but you need not quite stability, but sufficient to know x falso for what 
just some substitution instance of B. So that we can expect to hold in intuitionistic logic already. The other direction, again, is for free when you unfold this weak existence. And then finally, let's just look at what we can do if we have a universal quantifier in front and want to pull it out as an existence outside. Well, first case, if we have existence outside and want to bring it in as a universal quantifier, of course, without x, b, free, and b, then we need stability of b. And for the other direction, that also holds, but in this case, uh, remember, A may contain a three variable X, so we have to have the stability universally quantified, then we get the other direction. So this gives us, uh, let me just discuss it here, this gives us a kind of a survey of the interaction between the two, just uh, for, Making it a little more intuitive, you know, you all know probably this drinker formula in any non empty bar. If there is one person who drinks, then everybody drinks. So that is provable if you use a weak existential quantifier, and we have used it, down, we have proven it down here. If you just let B be the formula everybody drinks, and A be the formula X drinks, then the premise is clear. If Everybody drinks and everybody drinks. And the conclusion is a drinker formula. So there must be a person X such that if X drinks, then everybody drinks. So this drinker formula comes out here in quite a natural way. Well, finally, in this comparison between minimal logic and idiosadistic and classical, let me mention the Gensen translation written A over G. And uh, this is defined for all our formulas here. So if we just have an atomic formula, then the Gensen translation is its double negation. And we do that only for R, which are not falsative. For falsative, we don't need to do anything. The two crucial cases are the ones here, the ones uh, line three and four. So the Gensen translation of A or B is just translating the inner formulas and using uh, turning the strong existence into the weak one and similar for existence. For arrow and conjunction, you just pull the translation inside, so it's a homomorphic operation for these two connectives and for the universal quantifier the same. So that's syntactically a very easy kind of thing which translates an arbitrary formula into a formula which doesn't use the strong existence and the strong or anymore. And then the following is easily provable. This Gensen translation is always stable. So you can prove in minimal logic that not not AG implies AG. It's quite an easy proof by induction on A. And now the theorem says something about how exactly this embedding of classical and minimal logic, which I showed you in the first slide, actually works. So assume that gamma derives from classical logic A, that means derives it using the stability uh, formulas. And then we can, if, if you now Gensen translates and you get the corresponding derivation, but now from the translation of gamma into the translation of A. And also the other direction holds. So if gamma G derives AG, then we know that gamma derives classically A. But again, this can only be proven if the formulas involved here are the ones which are only of interest for somebody disregarding the strong connectives. So for classical person, in a sense, we have indeed an equivalence between these two notions, which means in this sense, to find what classical logic does inside minimal logic after applying the Gensen translation. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say on this subject. Now let's turn to the connection to lambda calculus, which is a so-called Curry-Howard correspondence. And uh, let's have a look 
or what it is. First of all, I will make a restriction here for simplicity. I only consider derivations or derivation terms, as they will come out in a minute, just for the rules for implication and universal. All what I'm saying now in this section can be extended to the full set of logical connectors, but it's getting a little more complex and would be outside the time frame that I have here. So let's just stick on implies and both. So the first step is to get rid of these free-like derivations, which can become rather big when you write them out, and just do a certain translation from two-dimensional derivations into one-dimensional terms. So how do we do that? The main idea is that we just linearize all these uh, rules. So the simplest case is the assumption rule. If you assume A with label U, then the corresponding term is just this variable U with an upper index, the formula A. So we use formulas as types, as sometimes said, so we take them as indices to our terms. Now for error introduction, you have seen that rule a minute ago. How do we linearize that? Well, I already told you that this premise derivation of B from U is already translated or can already be translated into a derivation term written again as M and the derived formula is B. Now the arrow introduction binds this assumption value U. So the binding is, is expressed as common as lambda calculus by the letter lambda and the variable you bind is this variable U up here and for clarity I give it the upper index A because U is an assumption variable of formula or type A. And the whole thing gets as label, uh, gets as uh, formula or type A arrow B. Okay, so for arrow lim, it's rather clear what we do. We just have M of uh, deriving A implies B and N deriving A in this gives us B. Again, for the other connectives, it is can be done similarly. We only deal with the universal here. So the introduction rule written out here, which you have seen before, turns into again binding the object variable X in the derivation term M, and then noting that the new formula is for all X A. And as always, we have to make sure that the X is really arbitrary in this derivation which means all the assumptions, free assumptions in M, which say something about A, A about X, they are forbidden. You can't uh, assume something about X, X must be arbitrary in the sense that this applies to this term side as well. And for all the limb, again, it's clear what we do, we just take the derivation for all X, AX, apply it to T, and then the new formula is A of T. So let's look what generally has happened. So every derivation term carries a formula as its type. It's the first item here. And for brevity, we will usually leave these formulas implicit. So we have to think them being present, but it would mess up notation too much if we show them. Notice also that we can write every derivation term in one of these uh, three forms here. So either in the form U M vector, that means an assumption value applied to a list of derivation terms and also object terms. I just denote them as one long vector of type M. Then we have an abstraction with a variable V, which can be either an assumption or else an object variable. And then we have something which we call a red X or a reducible expression. Namely, we have an abstraction of the variable V in M and immediately following an application to N. And then finally, the final list of uh, derivation or object terms. So again, uh, written out here in the next three items, U can be either an assumption variable or an assumption constant, if we allow that in our setup. V is an assumption or object variable. 
and M, N, and L are either derivation terms or else object terms. And this item here, which we just looked at, is special in the sense that it can be simplified. You may use this kind of derivation as a detour because you first introduce, if we use an assumption value, you first introduce an implication by the left-hand side, and then immediately after that, you eliminate it again by, by using arrow elim. And then, of course, can be shortened. We'll display that in a minute in some more detail. So we call this kind of thing a reducible expression or radix, and it can be reduced by certain so-called conversion, and we call that a beta conversion. So here again, it is in the pictorial form. So here we have a derivation which ends with arrow introduction followed by arrow elimination. And now we simplify that or convert it by taking this very same derivation of B from A, possibly many times the assumption U. And for each of these occurrences of the assumption value U and M, we substitute this derivation term N for A. So in a sense, that is simpler, but uh, notice that this derivation, although it looks short, may be much longer than this one, because the assumption value u can be used many times. It may well be that this second derivation n is a huge thing, and it will be multiplied here as many times as the u appears. So this thing looks shorter, but it may be much longer. And when we don't use this pictorial representation, but our derivation terms, then what's written up there is exactly what you see in this next to last display. Or if we write it without formula superscripts, you see it as a very bottom. We just substitute n for the lambda bound variable u at this point. We have a similar uh, conversion for the universal quantifier. So again, we have here on the left, we have the derivation m of the formula a of x. And we derive for all x a of x by a for all intro. And then we have an addition given a certain term t and make an arrow uh, for all a limb and get a of t. And again, this can be shortened by just taking our term t and substituting it into this given derivation m of a. And the result is still a correct derivation because remember we had a variable condition here. That means all the open assumptions appearing up here do not say anything about x. So they are not changed by substituting t for x in their formulas. And again, this is the derivation term which you can use to display this picture up here. And if you write it without formula superscripts, it's sort of easy to memorize. Now, I would like to discuss uh, normal forms of proofs. And these normal forms will consist in eliminating all these detours or all these uh, radixes, if you want. And in order to do that, we need a little bit of notation. So remember, we have just introduced this conversion relation with a beta, with an implication and for universal. And we may just close this relation in the sense that we do it at some point inside a longer derivation term m. So that's the closure of the one step reduction. And how is it defined? Well, first of all, if you already beta reduce m to m prime, then we are in the closure. And the next uh, item B says that you can do that inside of your term. So if you already know m reduces in one step to one m prime, then the same is true to mn, which reduces to m prime n, and also with m on the right hand side. And finally, you also allow inner reduction inside a lambda term. So if you have a lambda Vm, that will reduce to lambda Vm prime as well. 
So this closure can be understood as reducing our derivation m in one step to n. And if you just look at the items a, b up here, then it just says it would be that the new term right hand side n is obtained from m by replacing a radix m prime inside m by its conversion results in the m double prime. You just take one radix inside a term and convert it. Let me give you one example so that you see that sometimes um, a little unexpected things appear. So uh, it's helpful here to have quite a large set of assumption variables, which you see up here, these three lines. So these are always assumption variables, and the formulas are written to the right of them. Sometimes are duplicated, but it doesn't matter. Just assume that we have assumption variables with these formulas. And now assume that we have certain things we would like to start with. Maybe we may call that axioms. And in fact, these were Hilbert's axioms for the implication, the propositional implication of logic. So the first one is called S. And this is a derivation term in our sense. So outside we have some arrow introductions. We find X, Y, and Z. And inside we have an application term. So first X is applied to Z. And let's check that it fits. Well, X is A implies B implies A implies A. And Z is A. So we can apply X to Z and we get a derivation of B implies A. So at this point, that's what we have. This derives B implies A. And now we need the derivation of B in order to carry on. And this derivation of B is given to us by this YZ. Why is that the case? Well, why is this thing? Sorry, we need the derivation of B implies A. And we get that by applying Y to Z because this gives us the desired B implies A. So altogether, we have a term here which derives A, this one. Okay, and so we have derived A, that's the right-hand side, and now we have three lambda bindings or arrow introductions, which are of these three formulas that you see on the left-hand side. That's S. Next, we look at the derivation K, which does takes the assumption value u of a and then first abstract b of type b implies a and then u of type a. So we have a implies b implies a implies a. And finally, we have another variant of this k, namely just b implies a implies b implies a, which is written down there. Now let's make a little game or exercise in normalizing or reducing a derivation term. So I write down some rather huge derivation, namely S applied to K applied to K, K prime. If I would write out the derivation, it would not fit on the screen. But if we write it as derivation terms, we just have a short notation. And so this, this first thing here is our S. This one, and then comes K, which is this one. And then comes k prime, which is that. Okay, now we want to do a conversion at this point. And what is it what we do? So we look at a radix. Where do we have one radix? Well, the, what we do is we just take this outside radix. You see, we have a lambda x something, and then this is applied to this thing. So we have to take out this thing and substitute it for the x in here at this point, and then of course delete the leading lambda. So what remains or what we get is lambda y lambda z. Now comes x z, which is now the second term, lambda u lambda y u for x, then z, and then again y and z. So x is just substituted in here. So that's one reduction or it's a one-step reduction in our technical sense. 
And this can be carried on again. So now we have, we look at this uh, inside red X here, lambda U, lambda V U, which is applied to Z. So that means we have to apply this Z here inside, uh, we have to substitute this U by the Z and delete the U. So we get lambda V Z and the rest remains unchanged. What's our next relics? This is this one here. Lambda expression applied to something. So we have to substitute this something for the V in the body. But there is no V in the body. So we just get a Z here, which is down there. And the right hand side still stays as it is. And finally, the same game again. We have a relic now. It's the lambda Y applied to something. So we have to replace the Y in the kernel by something. But the y doesn't appear. So what we get is finally lambda zz. So this sort of huge derivation term is by successive conversion steps reduced to the simplest possible one, namely the identity. And this can be also be formulated as a proof in Hilbert's applicational calculus of A implies A, which he didn't have as an X. So that was just meant to demonstrate to you that it might be clarifying or easier to look up with derivation terms than with all derivations. This is an obvious question which you can ask when you look at such uh, reduction steps, uh, will they terminate? Or might it be possible that we can carry on reductions infinitely? So let's look at this term here, which is displayed, and we might try and do some reduction in here. So we just uh, notice this is a radix. So this is the application of that radix. And now as before, when we convert it, we have to substitute this term for the first u and again for the second u. And then delete the lambda abstraction. But of course, what we get is exactly the same term. So we can continue when we would have an infinite uh, sequence of reduction steps. So this u applied to u cannot be given formulas because uh, if u is a implies b, then u should again be a. But every assumption value must have one particular form. So this thing cannot be written with formulas and uh, or more precisely, it's impossible to assign a formula a to u such that this is a derivation term. So this kind of problem at least uh, doesn't appear in our example. Now let's uh, look a little bit more systematic of what we want to do. We call the term normal if it has no detour inside. So if it does not contain a radix. And what's a reduction sequence? That's also rather obvious. So by a reduction sequence, such a thing here, we understand a sequence of one step reductions applied to a given derivation term M0. And in each case, we have a one step reduction. Now, if you are given a derivation term, say M0, then there may be many terms, finitely many, which are obtained from M0 by just converting one radix. M0 may have many radices, and we are free to choose any of them. So that means these finite reduction sequences, starting from a given term m, they form a tree. And the branching is finite in that tree because m can only contain finitely many radixes. And in each direction from this m, we make one of these reduction sets. And we call the term that strongly normalizing if this reduction term is finite in the sense that every pass is a reduction or every pass through that derivation tree, it's, uh, or leads finally contains a normal term which has no radixes anymore. 
such results are called well-founded. And now we are aimed at proving that every derivation term is strongly normalizing, so there are no infinite reaction sequences. This will be the subject of the next section on normalization. But uh, before doing that, I'd like to give you an example which uh, shows that certain rather reasonable further reduction steps uh, could possibly lead to reduction loops. So here I first give you the derivation as derivation and later the derivation terms, but for the moment let's look at these uh, little monsters here. So the first thing is the derivation of the formula B done as follows. You start with, a, with of an assumption U, A implies A implies B, apply it to W, you get A implies B, apply it again to W, you get B, and then you intuit, you, you make an error introduction with that W, which appears twice, and you get A implies B. Ignore the star for the moment. Now, in addition, we make the next assumption called B, that A implies B implies A, so we get A. And now we use our U up here again, A implies A implies B, and we get again A implies B. Ignore the star. And then we will give or consider in a moment a new derivation of M of A called M. And if we write it out here, we'll come down in a minute, then we get B. Now what's M? M should be a derivation of A and it, is, it, is, it assumes U, W and B. And how does it go? Well, apply U to W, which we've done already. Up there we get A implies B. Apply it to W again, you get B. Make an arrow intro, you get A implies B. And make an arrow a limb with B, you get A. So that's a decent uh, derivation and we may look for its normal form. But we may try to be clever in, in addition to converting radixes, we would also like to convert obviously unnecessary parts of this derivation. And here from this point mark star down to this point also mark star, we have the same formula. And in between we have just used applications, so no binding of assumptions. So it seems to be a good idea to just cancel out this sort of unnecessary step and just carry on from this point with the final thing. So let's look at this derivation step. Up here you have the derivation term. So it's U applied to V applied to this thing which we later which we called M a minute ago, and then the same thing again. So it's unfortunate I can't show you both on the same slide, but you see that the main thing is a U, then we have applied it to this thing, which is again U applied to something, and then this M up here was very similar to this one. So if you look at it, you can easily verify that this is indeed the very the derivation term here. One. Now we are trying to be clever, so we use a pruning simplification, which I already explained. So in between the two occurrences of A implies B, marked with a star, we just cut this stuff out. And then what remains is a shortened derivation of the one we had before. So this huge chain with just this part here being removed. And the M stays as it was. Now, what's the derivation term of what we've written here? Fortunately, we can see that on one slide. Well, it is an application of this derivation. And this one is an arrow intro, so it starts with lambda w. And then we have u, w, w, which is written here. And the m was just the same. But if you look at this item here, you see it is a radix. It's, it's even a head radix. The very first thing is an abstraction and then applied to something. So we take this something here and substitute it for the W. 
So we applied the substituting in this first W and also. And introduce extra, maybe reasonable derivation steps, which seem to simplify metas. We run into a truck and have lost our property of strong normalization, which is a subject we tackle next. So, so normalizations and what we want to prove is that it's always possible to eliminate detours in proofs. And it's not only possible, it's possible in the strong sense that however we eliminate uh, these predicates, we will always stop. And I'd like to present you that proof, at least in its main structure. And the main trick is that we just think of derivation tree, uh, reduction trees. And I introduce a notation here called Sn for M and K, Sn for strongly normalizing. And that should mean that the natural number K bounds the number of reduction steps to normal form. Or put differently, this k is an upper bound on the height of the reduction tree. And clearly, uh, what we are after, maybe strong normalization, just means that for our given term m, there is an upper bound k for all possible reduction sequences. So m is called strongly normalizing if we, if we have Sn of m and k. So we will work for a moment with this binary relation Sn on terms and numbers. And just notice what is obvious from the definition when we have Sn of m, m and 0, which this means m is a normal form, so there is no way to reduce it. And what is it that we express when we say Sn of m and k plus 1? Then that means if we just look one level up from the bottom, at all the m primes, which are obtained by a one-step reduction from m, then all these kind of successor trees above the first branching should have height at most k, and then m has also height at most k. So it's quite intuitive what this little s n means. And here I've noted some easy to prove properties of this uh, notion. So if k is an upper bound, then also k plus 1 is 1, clearly. Well, if k is an upper bound for an application, then of course uh, k is also an upper bound for the reduction tree for m, because we can always insist on reducing only on m. Now what happens if we have an application so if I will you apply to a list of derivation terms, so if we know upper bounds for the reduction trees for all the mi's, and since we can reduce in them separately, the sum of these heights is an upper bound of the height of the reduction tree for this new m vector. The lambda, the lambda case is particularly easy because we can only reduce inside lambda, so the reduction tree of lambda vm it's just the same as the one for m, just writing in number b in front. Uh, the final one is a little more interesting. So if uh, we look at a radix, so lambda v m v applied to n, and then followed by some list of terms or vector. And if we know that the radix, the head radix, where we just convert this one, which is m of n applied to a vector, if the reduction tree of this one is at most k, has height k, and if we know n has a reduction tree l, then this animal here has a reduction tree k plus l plus 1. So that's the property which is uh, easy to prove, and I will not uh, do the proof here for time reasons, but it's quite easy to do that by just analyzing the different cases here. Uh, I just have a second look at this lemma, and in particular as its last three cases, the one from C to E. And the trick now is that we just remove the bounds on the derivation tree, so we only have a 
on the height of the relation tree, all you have a unary relation, call it Sn with capital S and N, and then take the last three uh, items of the lemma as clauses of an inductive definition. Well, that's what's written here. So the essential idea of the normalization proof we are going to look at is to view these last three closure properties, C to E of Sn, without the information on the bounds, and think of this, these three uh, items as an inductive definition of a new set Sn. So it's written out here again. So if U is an assumption variable, and if M1 through Mn are all in this set Sn, then also U M vector is an Sn. The M vector might be empty, so this is the initial case. So any assumption variable is an SN. In the lambda case, we just uh, simply add the lambda in front. And this was the final E case here, where we just said, where we leave out the bounds. So this term with the head radix is an SN. If you know both, the reduct is an SN, and also the term N that we are substituting is an SN. So that's a decent inductive definition, and it also shows that it's very helpful in these proof-setting studies to work with inductive definitions, which is the central concept anyway. So here we define a certain predicate on derivation terms by these three clauses, and then the intuitive understanding is that this set Sn is the least set of derivation terms, which is closed under these three rules. So first of all, from this previous lemma that we had, it's obvious that any term M in this inductive set Sn is strongly normalized. Why is that so? Well, I already mentioned that this is an inductive definition, so it has the least fixed point, or written as an axiom, as an elimination axiom. And it says that any <coughs> property which is kept by this property of Sn, which is kept by these three clauses, is already all of Sn. And the property is here being strongly normalizing. So we just need the C and E, which was the items of the lemma, which we had before. So we already know every term in Sn is strongly normalizing. So we would be finished if we know that really every derivation term is in this set Sn. However, you may notice already that one essential thing is missing, namely application. When we have two derivation terms, M and N, apply modus ponens, then we would like to know that if both M and N are in Sn, then also the application, then we don't have that. That's the only missing part for our strong normalization group. So again, the goal is every term is in Sn, and that's strongly normalizing, and it suffices to show that this set Sn is indeed closed under application. Well, we will prove that, and in fact, part D of the following theorem says exactly that. If M is an SN, and N is an SN, then M N is an SN. Then However, when we want to prove that directly, it won't work, because we need, at some point, and when converting radixes, we need closure of Sn under substitution. And this has to be proven simultaneously with this statement C, with statement A, namely if we already know that M is possible at free value V is an Sn, and if we also know that N is an Sn, then also M with V substituted by N is an Sn. And B and D are very similar, it's just a uh, universal quantifier instead of implication. I will not mention that anymore. Now, the trick to prove this theorem, which is the only missing step, is to do a slightly clever 
proof strategy here. So what we will do is uh, an outer induction or the main induction on the height of the formula A. It's in fact a cause of values induction. And subordinate to this outer main induction, we have a side induction. And this side induction is on the set Sn. Remember, it was given by three clauses. So we can always assume that for the premises of the clause, we already have the claim. Now, let me sketch uh, how the proof goes, because it's really the heart of the whole matter. Uh, I will only deal with the implication cases, A and C. And uh, let's assume that n is already a derivation, which is in the set Sn. Now we have to prove A and C. I've written it out again. And also for convenience, I've copied the definition of Sn in this display. And now we will need to look at three cases, namely this one, the lambda one, and the heterotics one. And we start with the first one with an application of an assumption value 2 times m. So that's our case. Assume u m vector by, by the bar rule, where we already know the m vectors are an SN. Then we use the side induction hypothesis. The side induction was an SN. So we already know that the substitution, remember A is about substitution, the substitution of N for the variable V in M is in SN. So that's our side induction hypothesis. It's written out here. So MI of N R and SN. And now in case our variable U here, the head variable of that application term is different from the we we are substituting in, then we are already done. We can apply the very same rule. And otherwise, uh, if this u is the same as the we, we have to prove this one. That n applies m, m, m vector n is an SN. And at this point, uh, we use the induction hypothesis C, which was about application. And we already know that this n has a smaller formula as, it main, as its main index. You remember, we do a main induction on A. And we know that any mi of n derives a subformula of A with a smaller height. And so that's the proof. For C, it's sort of easy. We can just use the same rule, very variable rule again. So that was the first case. The second case is a lambda case. Already the first half of the slide is uh, repetition uh, for you, your convenience. That's what we want to prove. That's the definition of Sn. And here in this uh, lambda case, uh, the substitution case is similar. We can just use the lambda rule again. But we have a slight problem when we apply and when you are in the application case, because then a new radix occurs, lambda v m v applied to n. So this lambda v m v is the term we have to consider now. But we have the rule beta, the rule beta this one here. We already know when such a term of the form down here, this one, is an Sn. We know it by rule beta, maybe taking it with L empty. So we just have to prove these two things. So by beta, it suffices to prove that this one, mn, is an Sn, and also that n is an Sn. Well, the letter was an assumption. We always assume n is an Sn up here. And the former is by the side induction A, because the side induction is on a smaller term, on a formula with smaller height. And say so we already know that it's closed under substitution. So at this point where we need to make a proof by simultaneous induction, both application and substitution. And finally, the beta case, which is difficult only by length of the terms involved. So we have uh, this uh, radix, which was in, in beta up there. And we assume we have it from these two premises here. And again, we have to deal with the substitution case A and the application case C. 
Well, if we answer substitution case, then by the induction hypothesis for A, namely with subterms, we know that this thing here, which this one, that this is in Sn because we just substituted for the variable in subdelegation terms. So that's the side induction hypothesis. And we also know K of N is in Sn, again, side induction hypothesis. So we just have to apply the rule beta again to get the result. And see that application is sort of trivial. You just have to use beta again. Okay, so that's it. So what we know have is that every term M is indeed in the set Sn. And this means in particular that every term derivation term is strongly normalizing. And how do we prove that? Well, we remember the little table I gave you earlier on, what are derivation terms? We have just these three cases, assumption variable, abstraction application. And in the cases U and lambda Vm, the claim follows immediately by the definition of Sn and the somewhat nasty application case that was just the subject of the theory we have seen a minute ago. So that's all I want to say about normalization and the fact that every derivation strongly normalizes. The next item I'd like to look at has to do with uniqueness. I mean, we know if I give you a derivation, there's always a norm and you start reducing it. It may take some time, but you are guaranteed to finish. But how do I know that the result is independent of the path in the reduction for you done? can start at the very left or at the very right, and it's not at all clear that the final result is uniquely determined. And that's our next section we would like to look at. So what I want to show is that the normal forms with respect to our conversions are uniquely determined. And the proof we will look at relies essentially on the fact that we already know termination of our one-step reduction relation or, or the well-foundedness of the one-step reduction relation. It is essentially a variant of a combinatorial result of Newman quite a while ago, but I will just use the particular application to our situation here. We need some notions, some easy notions. The first one is a well, general notion, namely that of a confluent relation. And being confluent is also appearing in the literature as having the church crosser property. So what does it say? Well, suppose you are given the term M0 and you reduce it to M1 and you have possible other reduction to M2. So you start from M in the two directions, to the left and to the right, you reduce to M1 or else to M2. And the, con the relation is confluent if in this situation there is a new term M3 with a property that the left and the right redux that we had before can be reduced in one step to the very same train uh, uh, term M3. So in that sense, they flow together, so they are congruent. So there's a, a, just a nice property of a relation, and we give it this name. We will have occasion to look at a variant of this notation, which is called weakly confluent or weak church Rosser property, which is almost the same. So we are starting with the very same situation. You are given the term M0, and you can reduce it to either M1 or else M2. And the claim again is we can bring them together again. So there is a term M3 such that M1 reduces to M3 and M2 reduces. So what's the difference and why is it weak? Well, it's weak because I have a little star up here and the 
reduction arrow with a star just means the reflexive and transitive closure of M. So up here we had just exactly one reduction step. Here we had a finite list of reduction steps, which may be empty. So that's called weakly contract. And let's first prove that our one step reduction relation is indeed weakly contract. Now, how to do that? Well, again, we start with this situation here with a slightly different notation. So M is reduced to the left to N and to the right. Ah, no, sorry, this is just notation. I uh, revert the uh, arrow to make things a little more readable. Okay, that's obvious. So here we are. We just assume now this is slightly different notation that we are given the term M, which to the left reduces to N0 and to the right to N1. And we want to bring N0 and N1 together again by finding common reduct N, but it's only a reduct in the sense that there is a possible longer reduction sequence from N0 and N1 to N. So we want to prove that, and the proof is by as to be, is to be expected induction on our given term. And there are three cases which are helpful to distinguish. So first of all, think of this long term M here, and somewhere inside we have one particular subterm which we would like to look at, and assume that we apply the same, to this very same term, two different reductions it's on the same subterm. And then, of course, we can just ignore everything that's outside the subterm, leave it constant, and just reduce the two reducts of this inner term again by our induction hypothesis, it's a proof by induction M, and then clearly we have a common reduct of the two. So that's sort of an easy case. And the next one is as easy. So suppose we have a long term M and then two subterms which don't overlap. And now we substitute the left hand side, we, we convert on the left hand side the left subterm and on the right hand side the right subterm. But then, of course, if we do the conversion on the remaining as our occurrence of the subterm, we clearly get the same term again. So that's also obvious, and we don't need the star here. That in both cases, it would be without the star. The critical case is the last one, when these two reductions sort of interfere. So when we have on one side a head reduction, and on the other side an inner reduction. And for that one, it's easiest to have a pictorial representation. So here you see three little diagrams, and they all uh, concern a radix. So this term up here is a radix, and uh, now the case we are in is that on one side we make a head reduction, that is we reduce that radix, that's always the left, and on the other side, we do an inner reduction. So we reduce either that M here, or this N, or one of the items in L vector. So first case, in this upper left picture, we do a head reduction to the left. Then we have M of N followed by L vector. But on the right hand side, we do a reduction on that M which of course doesn't concern the V, so we get just M prime, and again, lambda abstracted with V. The rest remains. Now, how do we bring these two terms together? Well, on the right-hand side, we just do a head conversion again. So we substitute this N for the V, and here we get M prime of N L vector, which is one step. And on the left, lower left side, we just use a property of our reduction, which is called substitutivity, which means if M reduces to M prime, 
then the same thing is true if we substitute some variable inside m for an arbitrary term cap n. So we just carry that through. The reduction isn't affected. It's only this part inside m, which is. So this is again one step reduction. OK, so that's it. The somewhat critical case is this right hand side here. Let me see if that finds the arrow. Yep. And in this case, we do our conversion inside this term n. Go on up here. OK, to the left, we make a head conversion, same as before. And to the right, we reduce now the first applicant, namely n, to n prime. That's also a one step reduction. Lower right, we do a head, recursion, a head reduction again, and we get m of m prime followed by L vector. And now we have to go to the lower left arrow. And here you notice there is a star. Why do we need a star here? Well, it's the thing that came up before already. The variable v that appears here inside our term m may appear many times. And in each of these occurrences, we have to substitute n. So this m here may have many occurrences of n. But to go from mn to mn prime, remember, we have a one-step reduction. So we can only reduce one item at a time, or one vertex at a time. And here are many. So we have to work at one after another, and as many ends there are, as many one step reductions we have. So here we get a star, and that's the reason why our lemma only says something about a weak reduction or weakly confluence. Okay, final case is the one where we just reduce inside our L vector, and that's sort of easy. So to the left, as before, to the right, I just write L vector prime to indicate one item in the list has been reduced. And now we just keep this L vector prime in the head radix on the lower right side. And then we are done again. OK, so we know the, our one-step reduction relation, the one we are studying, is weakly conflict. And now this is not enough. We want to show it's confluent. And how do we do that? Well, that's another little trick that we need here. First of all, I have to recall the notion of bar reduction, which is a sort of intuitive thing, but I'd like to explain it. So remember, we already came to that, that the finitely branching reduction tree, I call it T sub M, which has the term M at its root. This is, as it's sometimes said, well-founded. That means it has no infinite paths. And if we have finished them, I would, we can conclude it's final. Anyway, we only need the well-foundedness. And now we, as a proof to follow, we will use the principle of bar induction, which says the following. We would like to prove a certain property E for all derivation terms by bar induction. How can we do that? Well, assume that this property E holds for all normal derivation terms. So for us, the E, the property E <coughs> will be that it's strongly normalizing. And clearly, a normal derivation term M has this property, because we can't normalize anything that's already normal. And assume now further that we can infer E of M from the same property E at all the finitely many one-step reduns of M. So remember, it's a finitely branching tree. That's what I stressed up here. There are only finitely many branches. So we have, for the given M, we have finitely many successors. And for all of these M primes, we assume we already have E. And then we can infer that E also holds at the M. And from these two properties, we can work our way down from the leaves of the reduction tree to the root and end up with uh, that this root has a property E, which means strongly normalizes.
That's essentially the idea of, of Newman's lemma here. Now, how to prove that the normal form is unique? That's our goal in this section here. The trick is introducing a particular property of derivation terms, which uh, I call good here. And a term M is called good if it satisfies the, satisfies the confluence property, but now with respect to arrows uh, to reduce this star or the transitive and reflexive closure. So written out in detail, uh, assume that you are given a term M and assume that you can reduce it with possibly many one-step reductions to both K and to L, K left, L right. And then the property of being good says that in this case, you can get the two together again to a common reduce a star uh, redux called N. So it's just a generalization of the confluence property, but now to the transitive and reflexive closure. And we want to show that every term is good. And we will see in a minute that it is sufficient. So we do that by bar induction. And the property is exactly this to be good. And I already mentioned that clearly every term which is already in normal form is good. And <clears throat> we also assume that uh, given M, you know, that uh, every one step deduct M prime of M is already good. And then we must show M is good. Now, how do we do that? Well, we assume, what we have to assume that this thing holds here that from k, that from m you get to the left to k and to the right to l with finally many steps. Uh, we can also assume that each of these two reductions here is non-trivial because if, uh, the, if the k is the same as m, the lemma is trivial. So we can always assume that we have this situation. So from m, we first go to some m prime and then with finally more steps to k, possibly zero, and on the other side as well. And now we can finish the proof, which is again with a little picture. So here to the two diagonals, we have what we, the situation I just described. So from m, we first get with one step to m prime and then to k. And on the right hand side, first one step to m double prime and then to l. The last one is a star thing. Now look at this upper triangle here. We already have proven that our relation is weakly confluent. That means there is an n prime, so that from, such that from m prime and m double prime, we get to n prime, both with finitely many steps. We don't know how many. And now remember that we do an induction on m. Uh, sorry, on the, on the uh, we do a bar, in, bar induction, so we already know that both m prime and m double prime has the property we are after. So we first apply that to m prime. So this m prime already has a reduct k and a reduct n prime, both with finitely many steps. And the induction hypothesis says us these two can be joined, so that an n double prime. Full we'll stop. That's this part of the proof. And now we look to the right. We have an M double prime. And again, the induction hypothesis now applied to this diagonal here from M prime down to N double prime. And on the right from M double prime to L. The induction hypothesis tells us again that we can join them, leading us to a certain term N. And if you look at this picture as a whole, it just tells us that we are confident. And that's the end of the uniqueness proof. So we are now in this, we have now achieved what I wanted to prove that normal forms exist and they are uniquely uh, determined. Finally, I would like to say a word about what do we know more when we have this proof of uh, normalization or what 
or nice properties of proofs in normal form, which generally proofs would not have. So we would like to look at the structure of normal proofs. And the goal is to write a certain property of these normal proofs, which is known under the name of subformula property. And in order to formulate and prove it, I have to introduce some notions, particularly the notion of a track in a derivation M, which, uh, and this notion even makes sense for non-normal derivation. So what is a track in a derivation M? Think of the derivation now as a tree again, as a two-dimensional thing. And we will also particularly look at formula occurrences, not just formulas, but formula occurrences in this derivation tree. So what again is a track? It's the finite list of formula occurrences, the length of least, at least one, where this, the first one, A0, is a top formula occurrence in M. It might be bound later on, but at least when we write out the derivation term, and we have seen examples for some time now, then it's just in this sense a top formula occurrence. And then in between, all these formulas AI for I less than N should not be the minor premise of an instance of arrow a limb. Remember arrow a limb was modus ponens, to the left we have A arrow B and to the right we have A. And this right item is called minor premise. And so in the middle of our track, we should never be in a minor premise. So we can only walk, walk through the main premise of an arrow limb. And also a, the next one has to be directly below the previous one, AI. And where do we have to stop? What, what is the possible finite thing? Well, this AN is either such a minor premise of a modus ponens, or else it's the very end of the whole derivation, the final conclusion of that. So that's a track. And we can order these tracks. So the track of order zero, or the main track in the derivation, is the, in our case, unique track which ends with the conclusion of the whole derivation. So we can just start with the conclusion and then go up. So it's unique. And what we find when we go up to the end where we reach a leaf of the tree, that's called the, the main track or track of order zero. But of course, in between, we may have run through an array limb. And if you look at the main premise, uh, the side premise of this arrow limb, this start, may start another track. And if the main premise goes on a track of order n, then the thing on the, which starts with the side premise, the track of order n plus. So it's quite easily imaginable and uh, one can also see very easily that each formula occurrence in the derivation tree belongs to some unique track. Okay. <clears throat> Well, that's uh, formulated even as a lemma here. So in a derivation, each formula occurrence belongs to some track. And that's easily proven by induction on derivations. Now I'm aiming at the so-called subformula property. So that's this theorem here. In a normal derivation, each formula is which occurs somewhere in this possibly huge derivation must be a subformula of either the n formula or else of an assumption formula. And this is quite an interesting observation already due to Gensen, because it tells us when we have, uh, when we consider only normal proofs of some formulas from some axioms, one might think from experience that it might be necessary to introduce some auxiliary notions. I mean, talk about some notions in our language which are not part of the conclusion and also not part of one of the axioms that we have. But the theorem says this is not the case, at least not in principle. It might be still be useful to have auxiliary notions, but when we only look at normal derivations, then this is not necessary. We can always find a derivation which doesn't make any detours and doesn't use any concepts 
that you that are new to the situation that are neither in the formula you want to prove nor in any of the answers. And this can be proved, and in fact, we will do that in a minute by looking at the tracks. And uh, the tracks are ordered, as we just mentioned, and we do an induction on the order of such a track. So let's start with considering our normal derivation M. And uh, the derivation is normal, that, that means an elimination rule can never have the conclusion of an introduction rule as its main premise. Why? Well, if we have first an introduction and immediately following an elimination rule, we have a relix. But normal proofs don't have relixes. But we always know all our elimination rules precede all those introduction rules. And this gives us the pictorial way to look at these tracks and proofs. So it may be divided into an elimination part, this E part here, say A0 until AI minus 1. And then we have something which might be called the minimal formula, because always AI plus 1 is a subformula of AI, since you are in an elimination part. So we somewhere we have a minimal formula and then the introduction part starts. And they have a clear structure with respect to subformulas. And now what are tracks? Tracks are pieces of paths such that this AI plus one is a subformula of AI or vice versa, because in each step we go from or into subformulas. And all formulas in a track are subformulas of either the initial one or the final one. And by induction on the order of tracks, you can prove that every formula in M is a subformula of either an open assumption or of the conclusion. And that's all for this subformula property. I have a final slide, which I think I still have a minute to tell you. So, uh, the minimal formula in a track, this in our case can be either an implication or universal. And there are cases when we would like to have the minimal formula always to be atomic. So not composed as, as up to now as it was the case. But this can be easily done by something which is called eta expansion in the literature. So you replace this such a minimal occurrence, say of A, implies B by this little derivation. So you first make an arrow in for A, then you get B, and then again you make an arrow intro canceling that B. So in this case, we have reduced the minimal formula to B, and the same with the universal modifier. So repeating this process, we obtain a derivation in what's normally called the long normal form with the additional property that minimal formulas are atomic. That means neither implications nor generalizations. Okay, that's it for today. Next week, I intend to look at one aspect of this normalization, which is sort of prominent and interesting, namely complexity. How complex is it to bring uh, derivations to normal form? And it will turn out to be horribly uh, complex. And how can we tame this complexity? That's it for today. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's first uh, thank the speaker uh, for the very interesting and the wonderful lecture. And this lecture uh, proved to important theory of the uh, natural deduction for minimal logic. Uh, so that uh, any proof for minimal logic can be transverted into a normal proof. Any normal proof has the super formula property. So very too important uh, to uh, theorists. Also his proof is done uh, in a very clean, okay, very beautiful. Okay, uh, now uh, let's give time to our interlocutor, Dr. San Sanders. Uh, okay, please. Uh, San Sanders, now your turn. Uh, I'm trying to share the screen, but Professor Schustenberg uh, has to unshare. Oh, I have to, I'm sorry. Exactly. I'm sorry. No problem. All right. So 
Uh, yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I, when I saw the slides first, I thought, well, perhaps the interlocutor, myself, should provide some kind of um, yeah, background to all this. And that's what I will do in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So Professor Schustenberg mentioned this is part of proof theory, which came to give in existence in the form of Hilbert's Beweis theory, which literally means proof theory. And Hilbert had rather foundational aims. So he wanted to prove once and for all that math has a proper foundation and there's nothing to worry about for various philosophical and foundational reasons. So the idea essentially was, well, we have Cantor set theory, etc. Prove once and for all that these axiomatic theories are free from contradiction. So you cannot prove, say, zero equals one. And these proofs should be above any reasonable doubt. You should only use finite area means, whatever that means. So, but the idea is clear. Formulate axiomatic theories for mathematics. I mean, ZFC. was being developed back then. I prove that it's consistent using this was actually a quite impressive leap. So the birth of proof theory comes about when you think, well, maybe we should study proofs as abstract objects. Because well, you you say, well, all proofs have a certain property. Any proof cannot, in this system, cannot lead to zero equals one. So, proof theory this was an analyst working in non-standard analysis, and for him this was one bridge too far. Like, how do you mean proofs as abstract objects? So he said, no, 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 that's uh, that's not my neck of the woods. My other supervisor, Andreas Weidmann, of course, yeah, he relishes in this sort of thing, but then he does not accept much beyond second order arithmetic. So, yeah, that's uh, another uh, restriction, say. But so the main point is this conceptual leap. Hilbert, this goes back to Hilbert, namely, let's look at proofs as abstract objects. Now, of course, you all know, you all know this man, and perhaps this one too. Uh, girls' incompleteness theorems are often taken to mean that Hilbert's program is impossible because no rich enough logic system can prove its own uh, consistency. So, yeah, definitely, like ZFC cannot prove its own consistency. So, that seems to suggest that David Hilbert's program is impossible. Others don't agree with this interpretation. I'll let you be the judge of that. But so proof theory about a hundred years ago or more came to be as a very uh, foundational enterprise. Now that of course wasn't the only thing. Professor Schustenberg also mentioned intuitionistic logic and we have Brauer to thank for that. So I have to get my next. So yeah, Brauer already as a young man he had this grand idea that mathematics should be constructed or built up from the ground. And he developed an entire philosophy of math around it, which came to be known as intuitionism. So this was already Brouwer as a young man. His supervisor told him to can it for a while. So Brouwer first proved a bunch of interesting stuff in topology, became famous, and then returned to developing intuitions. So, of course, intuitionism is somewhat radical because he rejects most of set theory as pioneered by Cantor and promoted by David Hilbert. It's too infinitary, it doesn't make sense, it can be built up from the ground, so Brouwer flat out, flat out rejects it and his worldview. And of course, Brouwer and Hilbert had a bitter struggle over this, the Grundlagenstreit. This is all part of history. Um, yeah, that's all history. Now, of course, uh, good things came out of intuitionism, however. 
So Arendt Heiting, this guy, student of Brouwer, he formulated intuitionistic logic, which is a formalization of intuitionistic reasoning. And there, in this context, there exists X means X can be constructed in finitely many steps, uh, building up from the ground, as I said. Brouwer, Brouwer Heiting and Kolmogorov, BHK, Interpretation is then a similar constructive meaning for all logical symbols. And we should also mention Cleany, Stephen Cole Cleany, who gave the realizability interpretation. These are all ways of looking at the logical symbols that have a certain computational meaning. And yeah, if you if you believe in BHK, if if everything has to have constructive meaning, then of course the law of excluded middle must be false. A or not A would mean something along the lines of there's a final procedure to decide whether A holds or not A. Well, I would want one of those. Just take A to be uh, P versus MP or something like that. So if you believe that existence means can be constructed in finitely many steps, then and the same for disjunction can be decided in finitely many steps. Then, of course, the law of excluded middle is false. Now, it's not all struggle, etc. Professor Schwiesenberg mentioned what is or what amounts to the double negation interpretation. So, Gödel also showed that classical arithmetic, so yeah, arithmetic with classical logic and the usual induction, versus heighting arithmetic, so yeah, arithmetic with uh, intuitionistic logic. They're connected via the double negation translation. So you, this translation, uh, here, here it is actually. So this translation N injects two negation signs in the right spot. And this is the way in which uh, yeah, you can interpret classical mathematics in uh, constructive mathematics for arithmetic. And so this is something that Hilbert would have liked, of course. If plastic uh, arithmetic is inconsistent, so if it proves zero equals one, then so does uh, intuitionistic arithmetic. Of course, Professor Schwistenberg and the constructivists would say, yeah, but we don't just care about consistency, we care about computational meaning. But, I mean, this should be mentioned nonetheless. And then we're coming to the more modern age. And this is, uh, yeah, again, Brauer Heiting. So the problem with intuitionistic math is uh, yeah, it's based on non-classical axioms. So one of the axioms of, or theorems, if you want, of intuitionistic math is that all functions on the reals are continuous, which seems to contradict classical mathematics. Of course, bar induction, which is a kind of constructive transfinite uh, recursion, uh, that is classically acceptable. But so the problem is that continuity, everything is continuous, can be acceptable classically. So, and similarly, the H from the BH, uh, the K from BHK interpretation, Kolmogorov, he developed a kind of recursive math where you have intuitionistic logic and, uh, again, a non classical axiom, all reals are recursive, which also implies that all functions on the real are continuous. So, yeah, that's all problematic. And along came Eric Bishop. So, he essentially tried to develop mathematics informally, so it's not a formal approach, based on intuitionistic logic and consistent with classical mathematics and well, with the other, uh, with the intuitionistic and recursive math. So, it should be mentioned, Bishop, already as a young man, also had these constructivist tendencies. So he, he worked in rather abstract functional analysis. And then in later life, he yeah, started doing his constructive analysis project. But long before that, he was already, in grad school, he already had these constructivist tendencies. And a more formal approach is due to uh, Pierre Martin Leuf here on the right. Intuitionistic type theory intends to yeah, uh, be a foundation for mathematics based on intuitionistic logic. 
Of course, they've gave intermission the type theory gave rise to proof systems like Coq, which is pretty impressive uh, if you think about it. Uh, so, I mean, sure, classical mathematics is mainstream mathematics, but there's a lot to be said for constructive. Uh, so now, Professor Schuchling mentioned the Curry Howard correspondence. So essentially, it's a direct translation between computer programs, so lambda calculate essentially, and mathematical proofs based on intuitionistic logic. So this is uh, I asked the Curry and Bill Howard, Curry Howard. So Curry found some sort of special case, and Howard greatly extended this. <clears throat> we published this rather late, but he already had something in grad school, but he thought it was too trivial to publish. And Neil Narod pushed him to publish this, and it's one of the most cited papers in logic and computer science. And like proof assistant Agda, quite elegantly, is based on the Curry Howard correspondence. So it's at once a proof assistant, so yeah, you can type mathematical proofs, but they are also computer programs. And you can push this pretty far. And there are even proofs in constructive non standard analysis are, in a sense, computer programs. Trying Zhu and myself have looked at this, and yes, it works. I mean, we have some working examples. And as Professor Schuster mentioned, he, he'll move to Bochum, so maybe we can extend that work a little. Uh, now, one more slide on the concept of strong normalization. So I want to provide some intuitive motivation. So yeah, the machine before you, the computer sometimes hangs. It will run indefinitely without response. And this is annoying. So ideally, computer programs don't hang too much. And yeah, that's essentially the idea behind strong normalization. If you have a strong normalizing term, it has to, the normalization procedure has to stop. You cannot reduce indefinitely according to the rules that have been specified. And this is a nice idea that yeah, is rather central. And of course, if you prove this for a given type theory, this entails all sorts of desirable properties. Not all type theories have to have this. And sometimes you can just, if you don't have these properties, you can do it things by hand. Like uh, type checking is decidable in Agda, the proof assistant Agda I mentioned. Other proof assistants don't have it, but you just do it by hand and it's not that much work. So yeah, that's uh, my short history lesson, if you want. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs>